Uh, we're going to start the second half of the SOT Research Conference today. Uh, we talked about it yesterday, and then today we're going to have a wonderful group of presenters. Uh, Dr. Kukasin is coming all the way from the San Leandro and, and Palmer Chiropractic College, and he's going to be doing a presentation on leg lens. And Dr. Uh, Jeffrey Mursky is going to do uh, presentation on oxygenation, TMD, technical health, and a particularly a case in tour. Um, and Dr. Hollis King, uh, probably I consider one of the foremost researchers and collaborators of uh, osteopathic cranial research, will be uh, doing a presentation in the next hour. I'm extremely excited to hear. Um, so what I wanted to do is give a little presentation on the relationship between TMJ function and leg length. Uh, initially it was just something because Dr. Cooperstein was gonna do some, some uh, research that he, he's one of the top researchers ass assessing and understanding uh, the effects of leg length and chiropractic. And so I thought it'd be nice to sort of tie it into the conference. And as I was doing that start farming, it's a very interesting relationship. And that there seems to be a relationship between posture, occlusion, uh, TMD, temporal mandibular disorders, cranial mandibular disorders, uh, and it's controversial because the, there's aspects in the literature where people feel very strident and strongly that there is no relationship between posture and occlusion, and then there's other research studies that demonstrate that there is. So, uh, like with anything, it's, it's which end of the Elephant we're looking at. So one of the things we look at is that it's, it appears that from you know, a side view or frontal view, uh, there seems to be a relationship between the way uh, our body is positioned and the way our teeth touch, where uh, condyles position themselves. And a study by Fink uh, looked at this sort of relationship, and he found that looking at 20 subjects that he sort of did dental procedure to sort of mess with their occlusion, that he found that there was a statistically significant occurrence of musculoskeletal problems following the dental modification. And they seem to focus to the singular leg joint and cervical spine. Another study by Saguchi and others, uh, they did a randomized controlled trial with 24 males and 21 females. And what they did was they, they changed the occlusion also, and that they found that their body posture and their particular their ability to stabilize themselves in a standing position was compromised when they weren't placed in centric occlusion. When they were, they were better. Uh, they changed uh, postural positioning by putting little wedges or heel lifts under and they found that this would change the occlusal force. And they would measure it by, by the bite. Uh, this was where they were doing the stable, stable, stablometric assessment. And this is where they were looking at how, how the forces were distributed on bite or posturally with regards to the feet. A follow-up study by Meta in 2011 with, uh, also did a randomized controlled trial a small group, uh, but they found that whichever side they put a heel lift on, the patient would bite more strongly on that side, so occlusal forces would shift to the side of wherever had the heel lift. And they sort of concluded that there seems to be a relationship at, at, and that this leg length discrepancy affected body posture and dental occlusion, which is kind of interesting, trying to figure out why, how, you know, why would this happen? It seems so like unrelated to a large degree. And one of the things that sort of gave me a, a window into that, I, I remember reading an article by Mark Morningstar, and if you get a chance, it's a free download, full text, wonderful article. Um, and he was looking at the reflex control of the spine and posture and focusing on the visual vestibular and plantar reflexes and how they work. And that essentially, our eyes and ears are wired neurologically to stay level to the horizon through cerebellar reflexes. And that when the cervical spine's not in balance, 
So if there's something going on in the, in the cervical spine, the pelvis will change to keep the eyes and ears level. And if there's something going on in the lumbosacral spine, the, the cervical spine will modify. But as these things take place, these coupling between the two areas, the occlusion seems to be the, one of the things that also is affected. So we're looking at the relationship between posture being straight or, or being more balanced and imbalanced and how that seems to have an effect. Well, one of the things about sacral occipital technique that's kind of interesting is that we want to look at leg length assessments to determine how we treat patients. Particularly, we're looking at more, more than anything is the functional leg length. We're not looking at that actually the leg being shorter or longer anatomically. Uh, and so one of the things we look at is, is pelvic torsion, because pelvic torsion seems to be associated with the leg length, or leg length seems to be associated with pelvic torsion. And in chiropractic, we tend to see that uh, a landmark is the posterior superior iliac spine, and that on the short leg side, we believe it tends to go posterior and inferior, and on the long leg side, it tends to go anterior superior. And that's why we use those wedges or the pelvic blocks under there to sort of reduce that pelvic torsion. And one of the things we look at as we're, before we place the blocks is we want to do what we can to sort of reduce any stressors to the, the, the that may be affecting leg lengths, such as uh, iliopsoas tensions, piriformis muscle tensions that are affecting the greater or lesser trochanter. And then we do specific leg length assessments that we feel may have some relationship in the different categories. In category one, we believe there may be some Achilles tension uh, that's associated with the sh on the short leg or possibly even the long leg side, and atlas relationships that can sometimes influence that leg length. Uh, in category two, we're, we do a specific procedure trying to take out any abductor or adductor re related tensions before assessing leg lengths. In category three, we're looking at a patient with severe discal issues, which sometimes cause hamstring tensioning um, and sciatica. So we, we apply traction on the legs long enough to try to reduce any hamstring tension. Um, with SOT, we also have specific methods with each category so that after we place the blocks under the patient's pelvis, we then go back and assess. Um, and one of the things we're looking at is, do the leg lengths equalize? Is the Achilles tendon or Achilles tension balanced more? Is there any asymmetrical gluteal or sacrospinalis tension? Is that balancing or changing or modifying? Category two, we look at things such as the arm fossa test, medial lateral knee and gluteal ligament sensitivity, uh, and even you know, unilateral scalenous muscle tension, which will all change as the patient's on the blocks. So if they're getting worse, that would tell us maybe this patient does not have a functional leg length difference. Maybe it's anatomical. Maybe there's something else going on. And same thing with category three, as we place the blocks and try to find uh, a balance in, in reducing that pelvic torsion, we should find that sciatica any sort of tension with regards to the, in the gluteal area, mid-calf, will diminish during blocking. So the patient's response to SOT block treatment helps determine if the leg length assessment is correct. If unequal leg length influence appear to be ascending the kinematic chain. And when the patient's response to care is not as anticipated, is not what we considered that we would expect, uh, then we need to really go back and check, did we put the blocks in properly? Did we do the proper leg length assessment? If the leg lengths are equal, it would cause a problem to put torsion in that pelvis. Or is there an anatomical leg length issue that needs to be assessed? And that becomes part of our diagnostic you know, criteria. So in general, relationships appears to exist between occlusion, posture, uh, leg length and balance with an effect on, particularly on functional leg lengths. And based on this relationship with patients that have leg length or postural imbalance, it may be crucial when treating a patient with TMD to consider this ascending myofascial neurological component. Likewise, when treating patients with leg length or chronic postural imbalance, it may be crucial to consider TMD-related descending myofascial neurological components. They may all be 
related. So from a dental standpoint, we want to see if there's some postural things going on. From a chiropractic standpoint, if we working with someone that's just not responding the way we expect, we may want to look to postural occlusion and dental related 